we're trying to decide that um, I think you're the end of the general surgery um, presentations for the year. I said usually the guy who gets gets closer to the end was clearly was the person who signed up first, but that wasn't exactly the case. Um, but really thrilled to have Dr. Dorian, who, like many of you, have so loved his time at UC Davis that he just can't leave. So it's going to be staying with us for another tour as our um, MIS fellow next year. So we look forward to having him around and look forward to this very educational topic. I um, hope that no one's taking specific, um, you know, uh, how to do it lessons from you, but we're, we, we, uh, we suspect you're going to have a little bit of a different twist on that. So, Dr. Dorian. Thank you, Dr. Farmer. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. So, I first want to say I uh, really enjoy hearing and watching each of the grand rounds uh, given by my fellow residents. Um, and uh, the topic of my talk today will be on uh, methamphetamine, which may seem uh, like a bit of an odd topic, but I'll provide some uh, reasoning for my choice in a slide or two. Uh, so I have no disclosures. I will say I am in no way an expert on this topic and uh, <laughs> have not performed any specific research uh, on this topic besides the reading and exploration of the literature I did uh, for this talk. And uh, if there are any people in the audience that have any additional perspectives or information that can enhance our discussion today, uh, please feel free to speak up. So why did I choose uh, this topic? Uh, so for one, I really don't know much about illicit drugs. I grew up in the state of Maine, and I myself haven't used them. I haven't been, I've been fortunate enough not to have uh, them affect my personal life. Uh, but the state of Maine has had a significant drug abuse problem. Uh, but when I lived there, I never had heard about meth. Uh, cocaine and heroin uh, were the predominant hard drugs of abuse in the state when I lived there. Uh, but now per capita, the state has the highest meth-related deaths in the US, which uh, surprised me. Um, uh, whereas California is at the lowest, but uh, California is among the highest in usage of meth. Uh, so when I came here for residency, I noticed right away it was fairly common to have patients that were current or past users of methamphetamine. I still remember on CT surgery, my first consult patient uh, was a meth user. And uh, after realizing that it's fairly pre prevalent here, uh, it kind of sparked my interest. Uh, so. I started looking where most of us would have, and uh, I started watching this show. Um, but uh, on a serious note, every, uh, uh, every year the DEA releases an official document on the drugs uh, that are highest threat in the U.S., and methamphetamine continues to be at the top of that list, especially uh, in the West. So uh, furthermore, I think it's a great time to review the drug uh, because of the parallels that can be drawn between uh, the way methamphetamine became an abused drug and the ongoing uh, opioid epidemic. And as uh, physicians, we both have played a role uh, in these crises, so under, understanding the history and a little bit more about it uh, can be informative. So I'll go through some of the history of methamphetamine, how it was manufactured, uh, some of the theorized mechanisms of its effects which shed light on its medical and surgical effects, and then I'll provide some information uh, about its local prevalence and uh, local patient resources. So methamphetamine, it's a highly addictive potent, potent stimulant that uh, has its main effects on the central nervous system. It takes the form, you can see here, of a white, odorless, uh, bitter tasting powder that can be dissolved in water or alcohol. Uh, it has many different names um, that you can see here. I think the ones I've heard the most are, you know, meth and speed or crystal, but there definitely, definitely are some interesting ones on the, on the list here. So next I'll go through some of the history and background, uh, about methamphetamine. It was synthesized in the late 1800s and early 1900s from its, uh, parent drug amphetamine. You can see, uh, the addition of the methyl group here on the amine, uh, uh, to, uh, amphetamine. Interestingly, the roots of its discovery uh, come from uh, uh, China. There was a rare herb that was used in uh, Chinese medicine for over 5,000 years called ma huang, um, which uh, comes from the ephedra plant that you can see here. Um, it was used to uh, treat ailments such as cough, nasal congestion, and asthma. 
But in the late, late 1800s, a uh, Japanese chemist uh, seen here was able to isolate ephedrine as the source of the stimulant in the plant. And then this led to the synthetic production of ephedrine and ultimately to the synthesis of amphetamine and methamphetamine in the 1890s. So at first, these stimulants were used as, nasal, uh, as a nasal decongestion in, inhaler. Uh, Gordon Alice uh, was a well-known biochemist in the 30s who developed the uh, inhaler known as Benzedrine. Um, this was uh, marketed by Smith, Klein, and French, a pharmaceutical company uh, in the US at the time. I'll get into more detail about this later on, but it's important to keep in mind that like amphetamine, methamphetamine has uh, the same effects, it's just that methamphetamine differs in that at comparable doses, it has much uh, greater amounts of the drug that will get into the central nervous system and make it a more uh, potent stimulant. It also has uh, more harmful effects uh, on those uh, the CNS, um, and so it's uh, higher likely to be abused. So following the production of the inhaler, inhaler and then uh, tablets in the early 30s, most countries involved in World War II on all sides experimented and gave methamphetamine to soldiers uh, to increase their alertness for long missions and battles. It's fairly uh, well document, documented that Nazi uh, Germany used uh, this drug, uh, methamphetamine, which was known as Perbitin, um, to give to their troops. And then US troops uh, were prescribing uh, and handing out Benzedrine to the from the military, and then uh, it's well known that uh, Japanese kamikaze pilots also were provided the drug uh, during their missions. So through the 30s and 40s and 50s, amphetamine and methamphetamine were marketed and prescribed in the U.S. in various forms to treat depression, narcolepsy, and even weight loss. Um, these are some examples of uh, advertisements for it. Most of the time, you didn't need a prescription from a uh, doctor to get these drugs and uh, patients realized uh, and uh, their stimulant effects. They were known to open up the inhalers and start abusing them early on. The, the weight loss pills uh, were given out as five milligram, milligram tablets uh, and were usually taken about three times a day. I have a quick video, hopefully it opens, um, just kind of illustrating some of these points in the history. I did meth. This is my friend, the druggist. He sells the ice that I make. What a tempting, tasty dream. is appropriate. Throw them <laughs> so uh, methamphetamine, like I said, was used for weight loss and is uh, currently known uh, by its trade name Desoxin. It was initially approved in 1947 and still actually is FDA approved for short-term use uh, for weight loss. Its uh, mechanism uh, appears to be mostly related to effects on the central nervous system involving uh, serotonin and some other uh, mechanisms, but it really isn't clearly understood and it's now rarely uh, prescribed secondary to its high uh, addiction potential. As the video stated, amphetamine psychosis had already been observed in the 30s among long-term narcoleptic users of the drug and individual case reports mounted during the 40s and 50s. Um, there also became uh, solid scientific evidence emerging around 1960 that amphetamines were uh, actually addictive, uh, but physicians continue to prescribe them into the 1970s. Finally, by 59, the FDA required a prescription for the inhaler Benzedrine, but it wasn't until 1970 that Congress decided to regulate uh, 
methamphetamine and other drugs through the passage of the Controlled Substances Act. This act created the five schedules of uh, drugs that we all know about uh, where methamphetamine is a uh, Schedule II drug, which makes it legally available uh, only through a non-refillable prescription. But again, it's very rare, rarely prescribed. After meth became illegal in the 70s, the use of uh, the drug actually decreased for a little while. But in the 80s, it started to make a comeback with the production of meth from pseudoephedrine products. It grew during the 80s and early 2000s um, with its use. And this was mainly due uh, to the production of the drug from those pseudoephedrine products. Uh, in attempts to curb this, the Congress passed the Combat Methamphetamine Epidemic Act in 2005. And uh, this is when we all started to have to show our IDs uh, to buy these cold medicines. This act uh, attempted to limit the amount of uh, products one pers person could purchase in a day. So <clears throat> the, uh, that brings us up until present day where we are seeing the effects of meth abuse. And you can see from 2014 to 2016, the amount of meth overdoses more than doubled in the US. And comparing to last year, uh, to, to 2012, the amount of meth uh, seized at the border uh, from Mexico, Mexico and U.S. is more than tripled. So about a million people, uh, 1.2 million people, uh, report that they use meth every year. The average age is around 20 years old. While the national trends have shown that there are some declines in recent years, um, Methamphetamine abuse uh, varies very regionally, and according uh, to the U.S. Uh, DEA, has uh, strongest effects out here in the West and parts of the Midwest, as illustrated on the map here, uh, showing uh, laboratory seizures. Even though the use seems to uh, be fairly stable as a whole nationwide, the purity of the drug and availability of it has uh, increased um, with it coming across the uh, Mexico-U.S. Uh, border. So it kind of uh, provides the history of it. I'll next go into so briefly how it's manufactured. Um, so most of it uh, that's abused in the uh, U.S. is made in super lab, these so-called super labs in Mexico, but it's also made in some small clandestine labs here in the U.S. with uh, those over-the-counter uh, ingredients such as pseudoephedrine. These manufacturers uh, have adapted to the laws that I talked about <coughs> restricting pseudoephedrine uh, purchases. And they refer to this as smurfing, which means uh, obtaining the pseudoephedrine from multiple uh, sources using false identification. There's also a process called P2P that some of you may have uh, remember from the uh, Breaking Bad, uh, where they, uh, uh, which is predominantly used in uh, Mexico. But this uh, product, this does not require uh, the use of pseudoephedrine or ephedrine. Uh, so if you're still listening, uh, thank you. Um, if you're not, here's an attempt to kind of re-engage you. Uh, I know when I'm sitting out there, I always need re-engagement about every five minutes. Um, so I, I left uh, uh, Maine uh, and moved back to, uh, I will move to Massachusetts um, and went to Stonehill College in Easton, Mass, um, which is about 20 minutes south of Boston. Um, I don't uh, think this is coincidental, but ever since I moved there, uh, the pro sports teams have won 10 championships. Uh, and as a big sports fan, I uh, am um, uh, you know, pretty excited about that and superstitious, so it's obviously uh, from that. And also, when I added this in last night, I realized the mascot is smoking a pipe, um, which I don't know. Hopefully, that's not meth. Uh, so anyway. Uh, I'll get back to methamphetamine. In undergrad, I, I majored in biochemistry and took my prere prerequisites uh, for medical school, including organic chemistry, which is probably the last time I actually thought about uh, racemic mixtures. Um, but they helped understand the differences of the two most well-known uh, uh, production processes of meth. So as I mentioned, ephedrine and pseudoephedrine can be used as a precursor for methamphetamine. And when these precursors are used, uh, it produces D-methamphetamine. And this uh, this really is because ephedrine and pseudoephedrine are only uh, made in the uh, D isomer uh, and available in the U.S. So, um, uh, in contrast to that, when it's made with the P2P production, it produces a 
racemic mixture, which both uh, the DNL uh, uh, methamphetamine are in equal proportions. So old school abusers like the uh, just the D because it binds more uh, efficiently uh, to the receptors in the CNS. <clears throat> so how is meth abused? It comes in several forms. It can be smoked, inhaled, injected, uh, ingested. Um, it's currently most commonly abused uh, via smoking, uh, but smoking and injecting both put it quickly into the bloodstream and then into the brain, uh, which leads to an uh, intense rush. It usually lasts a few minutes, um, <clears throat> but uh, snorting and ingestion produces a, a euphoria, which is a high, but not as an intense rush like uh, the smoking and injecting. The effects are usually within five minutes for snorting and 15 minutes orally, and then the abusers um, sometimes will go on these binging uh, runs for days, uh, abusing the drug without sleep or food. Now, probably more people, or I knew more about cocaine, not because I use it or anything, but uh, uh, just because it was more prevalent uh, on the East Coast. Um, but uh, uh, so meth and uh, cocaine there's, uh, are both stimulants. It's, uh, uh, methamphetamine is structurally uh, similar to dopamine, which plays an important role in the regulation of reward. But it's uh, different from cocaine in that uh, uh, in structure. Although meth and cocaine have similar behavioral and physiologic uh, effects, there are some major differences that you can see here. For example, cocaine is uh, quickly metabolized in the body, whereas meth has a much longer duration of action, and a larger percentage of the, of the drug uh, remains in the body unchanged. Um, this uh, leads to more prolonged uh, stimulant effects. Cocaine, also the mechanism is slightly different, where cocaine prolongs dopamine actions in the brain by blocking just the reuptake whereas, uh, of dopamine, whereas um, methamphetamine uh, blocks, uh, increases the release as well as blocking the reuptake. So the, the euphoria from meth uh, comes from the release of dopamine, like I said, in, in the part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Uh, um, however, long-term use uh, causes molecular changes in the dopamine system contrib contributing to terminal nerve damage in the brain and can lead to short and long-term effects, which you can see in this table. It can uh, increase wakefulness and physical activity and decrease appetite. It also has a variety of cardiovascular problems, tachycardia, arrhythmias, can lead to hyperthermia and convulsions. Um, in addition, uh, for the long-term effects, addiction um, and chronic abusers, uh, often will have anxiety, confusion, insom insomnia, mood disturbances as well, and uh, psychotic features can be uh, unmasked as well. So I will uh, kind of go into some of the Sacramento County data that's available uh, for the amount of meth that's used in this, uh, in this region. But uh, first, I was in Buffalo bef after uh, uh, I left Massachusetts. My wife and I uh, moved uh, to Sacramento from there, and we were uh, at the University of Buffalo for medical school. It's a great uh, medical communi community, if uh, you're not aware. Uh, most of the residents know Dr. Schliemann uh, did his fellowship in Buffalo. Uh, Dr. Greenholds, uh, pediatric surgery doc, uh, went to medical school in Buffalo, and Dr. Graf did her fellowship there as well. Also, uh, interestingly, one of the reasons I uh, had heard about UC Davis was I worked with a, a pediatric surgery doctor um, at, uh, uh, at University of Buffalo, Dr. Oskides, who trained under Dr. Farmer and obviously encouraged me to apply here for residency. Uh, so now keeping with meth, uh, one of the other reasons that it caught my <laughs> attention when I got here is uh, because Buffalo and Western New York really had a more, uh, uh, if you look up there, uh, regional data, it's, uh, heroin is much more popular, and we saw that as uh, with patients in the hospital. So, it's working here. So, the uh, this data is from the Sacramento uh, County Department of Health and Human Services. It shows that about 40% of all admissions to drug rehab uh, in Sacramento County was from uh, meth use uh, from October of 2016 to September of 2017. 
you can see that uh, gender is about split for its use in the age distribution of users is really in the 20s to uh, 40s. The predominant user is uh, white. Uh, and now, because of the relatively heavy use in, of meth in California, a significant uh, portion of patients uh, that we treat here at UCD are past or present users. And when you start uh, reviewing the literature, there are several studies that have been published here by groups here at UC Davis. Um, so I'll go over a few of them, and I'll start uh, with trauma. So Shermer uh, and Wisner investigated the association of meth use in trauma patients at UCD in uh, 1989 to 1994. They reported uh, that methamphetamine prevalence in 18,000 patients uh, over that time period increased from 7% to about 13%. Compared to, when you compare that to the use of cocaine and uh, alcohol rates, which were fairly stagnant over that same time period, uh, the uh, this uh, percentage increase correlated with the national trends at, at that time. Another trauma-based study uh, looked at 10,000 patients at our hospital uh, from 2002 to 2006 by London uh, et al. and determined that minimally injured. Trauma patients, so those with an injury severity score of less than nine and were meth positive, incurred more cost and utilized more hospital resources than non-meth uh, positive patients. So from that prior study, if costs are higher, they may be higher for other meth positive patients submitted to the hospital as well, which can uh, result in financial strains on the health system. So this next paper uh, published by Richards et al. in the UCD ED was published uh, last year and compared data from a 1996 uh, study evaluating the amount of patients presenting the ED with a positive meth uh, result and data from 2016. They also showed that uh, the trend in meth use in the patient population here mirrored the national trend over that time um, with an increasing uh, prevalence of use. I think the most interesting thing from the paper from a surgical standpoint though is to look at the presenting complaints of these patients uh, that were meth positive. I underline the topics uh, here for their presenting complaints um, that we would most likely see as uh, surgeons in their blunt trauma, abdominal pain, skin infection, and penetrating trauma. And this, uh, this data here on the uh, incision and drainage of those patients with skin infection, it wasn't in the paper, but Dr. Richards uh, looked it over for me and said about 25% uh, of uh, that group actually underwent an IND. I don't have the specific numbers on uh, how much, how many got surgery consults, um, but we were probably uh, involved with some of those. So related to this, I looked to see if there were other factors that uh, may contribute to skin infections in meth users besides the common mechanical issues you think about when uh, you think of IV drug uh, uh, users. So the factors uh, that contribute to skin infections and abscess in um, Meth users are secondary to formication, picking up their skin, uh, unsafe injection practices, like I said. And then uh, what was interesting is um, there's an association with MRSA skin infections and that some there's some in vivo um, studies um, that show that the presence of meth may promote the biofilm uh, formation and then slow wound healing due to increasing activity of uh, MMP2, which would lead to decrease uh, uh, or increased uh, collagen degradation. It also, meth uh, really does affect most of the uh, organ systems in the body. We think about its uh, CNS effects most, but it has been shown that in vitro and in vivo studies um, that it alters antigen presentation in phagocytosis. Um, and also this can uh, lead to increased risk of infection. Now, the, one of the other present, presenting complaints was abdominal pain um, in this paper and uh, for meth positive patients. So I couldn't, I couldn't get the numbers on how many of these patients actually got a surgical consult, but I think uh, since uh, it's worth looking into the GI effects of um, methamphetamine. So it's, it's suspected that uh, these effects on the GI system are likely due to vasoconstriction uh, affects secondary to sympathomimetic um, response. And this can lead to cramping, constipation, diarrhea, uh, ileus, and bowel ischemia, which can ultimately lead to perforation. 
because of this, there's a group here at UCD that published their findings, a uh, study by Dr. Anderson, Jamie Anderson et al. Uh, was published last year. Uh, this was an observational study noting the findings of a series of 10 patients from 2015 to 2017 who were meth positive and developed non-occlusive uh, mesenteric ischemia requiring surgery. The study uh, highlighted and wanted to emphasize the fact that in these patients with meth use and especially other injuries and dehydration, that provider should have a high index of suspicion for ischemic bowel due to the associated GI effects. From an anesthesia standpoint, uh, when meth positive patients need surgery, uh, anesthesia should be delayed in these individuals if possible um, when uh, they've recently had uh, usage. Um, and this is mainly due to the increased risk of cardiac and, uh, arrhythmias and stroke. Um, if they're not able uh, uh, to delay surgery, then cardiac and uh, ECG monitoring is required and um, then symptom control for like hypertension and uh, cerebral excitability can be um, uh, controlled with beta blockers and benzodiazepines respectively. The main effect of uh, methamphetamine in terms of uh, anesthesia is that it results in an increased anesthetic requirement, meaning that it increases the minimal alveolar concentration for anesthetics. Uh, also, you can see that chronic use via snorting is uh, something to keep in mind as well because it can result in damage to the airway, complicating airway control and when you're intubating a patient. So wrapping up, uh, what are some of the treatment options for methamphetamine addiction? At this point, the most successful treatments are behavioral therapies. Uh, there aren't any approved medications uh, that are currently out there, but there are a couple that are in uh, clinical trials. Um, the first is a drug called uh, Ibitalast, which uh, it's an anti-inflammatory drug that actually is uh, showing promise in ALS and uh, MS uh, treatment. The mechanism of use uh, for in animal studies that show that uh, seems to decrease the, uh, the desire uh, to use meth. Uh, so it's just in safety uh, trials so far in humans. Also, um, anti-methamphetamine antibodies, I think, is a, a pretty uh, interesting concept. Uh, it's in development, and the safety testing in humans is underway uh, with the idea that users would be injected with the antibodies um, and then uh, these antibodies would neutralize the actions of methamphetamine when they injected that, preventing the effects of the drug. So if uh, anyone wants additional local information on resources in Sacramento County, uh, there's a, actually a methamphetamine coalition through the Sacramento County Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, they have a website. Uh, they actually have their annual meeting on the 9th uh, in a couple days, so I was surprisingly timely in my in my uh, talk. Um, but uh, there's also resources there and numbers uh, that our uh, social workers and discharge planners provide to patients in the hospital uh, for their outpatient follow-up. Um, so overall, in, in review, meth is highly addictive. It's a potent stimulant. It started out uh, as a drug prescribed for multiple ailments, and now it's rarely uh, used via prescription and mostly abused in the U.S. and actually um, in the world. Uh, the WHO had uh, ranked it as the most abused drug a few years ago, uh, hard drug uh, a few years ago. And when prescribed, uh, it is prescribed at uh, much lower doses than what uh, individuals use uh, for abuse, usually five milligrams or less when it's prescribed and upwards of 30 or more when it's abused. The Western US and Midwest have the heaviest uh, usage. The drug is most, mostly made in, in Mexico and smuggled into the US. And its effects throughout the body uh, seem to be primarily secondary to sympathomimetic uh, effects, and it lasts uh, much longer in the body compared to other stim stimulants. Um, from a surgical standpoint, uh, most organ systems are affected uh, in some way, uh, but specifically the risk of ischemia, infections, and wound healing uh, should enter our minds uh, when dealing with these patients uh, from a surgery standpoint. So that concludes my talk. Uh, I just want to thank everyone in the program uh, for an amazing uh, seven years here. Uh, 
it goes very quickly. Um, and I especially want to thank my wife uh, for her uh, support over this time. Thank you. Rob, that's great. I think that it's amazing how prevalent this is in all of the patients that we take care of and how much we don't actually know about some of the details. So it's really um, great. We have some time if people have some questions related to this. Let's start with Dr. Jerkovich and move our way back. Um, I love the presentation, Rob. Really timely topic. Nice to have it at Grand Rounds. I particularly like the connection between Maine homeland, high use, you're being biochemist. I didn't quite get the sports part of Boston. That was I just had to throw that in there. Just to, you know, upset. Really fit nicely. Well, uh, what does meth do that destroys a dentition on the patients? Mm. So, the uh, mostly just from their, like, uh, chronic use with binging and not uh, having unhygienic uh, practices. I didn't see anything specific on like an actual mechanism uh, like specifically for that, but honestly there's, I really didn't know anything about meth uh, before I started <laughs> looking at all this, so there probably is a paper out there yeah, yeah. that's talking about it. Yeah, so there's one researcher that uh, gets a ton of funding from the NIH, uh, specifically their uh, drug addiction section. Um, but uh, there's nothing really available yet. I know there's a couple drugs that have been re researching for a long time, um, but uh, nothing specific out there. Yeah, so a paper from UC Davis in was it 2002 to 2005, the cost actually was uh, all cost centers that, uh, for their stay. And it wasn't just like length of stay or the initial workup, which you would think of sometimes as being, because you just end up pan scanning and <coughs> labs, everything. Um, but it was actually all the uh, cost centers. Um, and, but those were, that was minimally, those were patients with like, minimal injuries that they looked at. Um, so those patients in the ICU would have been fallen out of that study. All right. Well, gosh, thank you, Rob. And um, maybe we're going to have to make our MIS fellows, you know, give, give the follow-up talk as well. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Really thank great. you.